Some may find the following disturbing. Discretion is advised. Never before in the history of sports podcasts have two men brought you opinion and analysis like these two. They speak for a city that's desperate for wins and titles, not whining and travesty. You might not agree with what they have to say, but you'll defend their right to say it. Sports fans across the world, from Chicago, Illinois, this is The Mac and Reed Show. Yes, yes, hello, and welcome into another edition of the Mac and Reed Show right here on the Barroom Network. Welcome into all those watching us on YouTube and listening to us, of course, as well on this platform. You can catch all our previous shows on YouTube and Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, wherever you get all your entertainment. You can follow us on Twitter. I'm at the Real Evan Mac. Follow Ross at Ross Reed as he's tweeting about. L.A. And, and Chicago's food scenes at this point. Chicago with the better Mexican food scene. L.A. with the better Asian food scene. Oh, my God, he sprays to all fields. And how are you, sir? I'm good. How you doing? Doing great. I'm a, a married man. Ross was there yes, and went off to another wedding. Uh, he yes. crossed the border. Well, that's what kind of a guy Ross Reed is, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's such a guy. Such a guy. We have a lot to get to on the show today as... We were off last week. The Bears lose. They fall to two and two most recently, and they prepare for a divisional matchup against the Minnesota Vikings, who are hot right now. Are Coach Flus and Coach Getze coaching a little bit scared right now? We'll talk about that. The NFL recap from week four and what to expect in week five. We have some contenders separating themselves, some surprises, some not so surprising. Bulls expectations as we talk about big injury news, of course, with Anzo Ball and how this team will prepare and bounce back, hopefully, from a disappointing first round playoff exit from last year. And surprises along the way. Ross isn't excited for, for baseball. It's spooky season. So we got top five horror movies to round out the show. Very exciting stuff. To begin. Talking about thanks, Nomad. What a guy. Thank you to the bar stool flies, of course, out here, uh, giving me giving me props for it. Ross. What did you notice? Was I jittery? Did did I look like I was ready to be married up there? You were you were cool, calm, and collective. Your your uh your media background definitely came through. You were very calm in front of everybody. You had the the soothing pipes going, and uh the jokes were were flying during the ceremony. It was fantastic. Yeah, you know, I especially I, loved um, when I showed up there. Everybody was 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 ushering in to where we would have the ceremony at, and you guys had these beautiful cocktails all around the chairs and stuff like that, and beers and white claws and wine. This, this and everybody just started grabbing them as as one would when alcohol was around. And the priest was like, "No, no, no! Legally and morally, we cannot have you grab alcohol yet." as this is still a church, even though we are outside. Uh, this, we were on, underneath God's church. Um, and so we had to put all the alcohol back until you guys said, I do, and kiss each other, and then we can move on to the, to the actual alcohol. And it would suck for Ross because he was leaving right after that. Uh, I did. And uh, yeah, everybody was like, boy, your priest is a dick. I was like, he kind of has a point, though. This should be treated as like, you wouldn't just crack a beer in church. Like, I, I get that part. <laughs> I wish you would. I'm just I trying wish to line would. people up. I was like, all right, let's just get this going. Uh, yeah, I had like an out-of-body experience. It was wild being up there. Uh, but quite a day. Quite a beautiful day. Fun. Not dealing with a sick child. But it's all the fun. And the honeymoon is over for now. But we'll, we'll get to that later. So... Leading off, though, we got to get to our sh- lovely Chicago Bears squad who fell to two and two again, most recently losing to the Giants in just a slog of a game. 20 to 12 was the final as they traveled to New York. And a lot of the same storylines that we've been following plagued the Bears. You know, you thought that the Bears might be able to sneak one out when Daniel Jones was a bit more limited with an ankle injury and Tyrod Taylor did not know what he was doing, but. Brian Dable is, is seems to be a good breath of fresh air for this Giants franchise that has been pretty bad to recent memory. Now they improved to three and one. 
and they're up there, um, you know, in, in talks with the Cowboys and Eagles for the front rankings in that division. But as, as far as the Bears go, you know, they're preparing for the Vikings who appear to be rolling. I, I don't want to dwell too much on this recap because we want to preview this uh, game coming up Sunday. That's a big one for the Bears. But Justin Fields struggling with this offensive line that's assembled in front of him. And, and I think a lot of critics and um, and former players will tell you firsthand that it's so hard for him to succeed with that offensive line, giving up a lot of pressure up front, especially in the interior from, from the uh, guards inside uh, to the center. And then the tackle play has it's been very hit or miss. The running game has been okay to pace the offense. But bottom line, when you put up, 12 points it's just all been field goals so that's tough uh, to really swallow from an offensive standpoint the defense it was pretty hit or miss going into this game and based on injuries whether it's injury scheme obviously playing against Aaron Rodgers and Lambeau that was, was very tough um, the Bears defense could have had some taken taking more advantage of some opportunities that they had that the Giants gave them in this last Sunday's matchup, but they couldn't stop the run game. Saquon looked like the healthy running back that he has been the franchise running back before injury. And he has rebounded uh, very well. Cause we remember actually when he injured himself against the bears last time around, these two teams faced off Eddie Jackson has looked like he's, he's trying to play as the top paid safety that he's supposed to be Roquan looking like a bright spot. He was all over the field again, but this defense really misses Jalen Johnson. There's, not too much of a pre pass rush. They weren't able to really pressure uh, the Giants. And, you know, they'd obviously thrive on takeaways as well. But Bears not taking care of the ball. It's it's a game of inches. That contributed to losing ultimately 20 to 12. And then they had a chance. I, you know, I love when teams, though, they had the longest that I had seen in a, in a while where you start playing rugby and you start pitching the ball back and forth. It must have went on. It felt like five minutes, but it was a very long sequence. Uh, the Bears almost seemed like they were going to pull out some sort of miracle there, but of course not. It was not meant to be. Uh, it was an ugly game, and, and I, I suppose Giants deserve to win based on Saquon's performance, based on just a more complete appearance, but impressions from that game, Ross, what you got for me? Yeah, I mean, listen, another uh, inept performance by the offense, right, and especially – um, in a game where where you the Bears should have ran the football a lot better, the the Giants struggled mightily last the week before against the Cowboys against the run. Also, just you know the offensive line is 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 kind of a glaring uh, weakness right now for the Bears, and it's more so the interior offensive line. Um, Sam Mustafer is probably the worst starting center in the in the NFL right now, and Thanks. a lot of people want you know Justin Fields to have better pocket. Per presence and be able to step up in the pocket and move to the left and to the right of the pocket it's really difficult when your 270 pound center is sitting in your lap in every damn play and and he just constantly gets pushed back he had one of the worst um you know according to pff he he had um under 10 uh in in his pa in his pass protection performance and that's just not going to be able to get it done and then you lose cody white here with an injury and lucas patrick i thought really struggled as well at the guard position and, you know, all in all, the, the Giants were able to sack Justin Fields six times. They had three sacks coming into the game. So they have nine sacks in the season, but they just they, – but six of them came in this one game alone. And, you know, you couple that with the fact that the Bears just don't have quality receivers on the outside, right? There's a lot of guys not being able to get separation. We've sang this tune for, for weeks upon weeks now. Uh, and, and you got guys like Dante Pettis who really shouldn't be a starting wide receiver in the NFL. And case in point – was that beautiful back shoulder throw that Justin Fields, you know, puts it onto him and, and Pettis goes up and he makes a great adjustment on the ball, but he just kind of, you know, stone fingers it and it just kind of pops right out of his hands. And that's just unacceptable, right? That's a play that we've seen, you know, Aaron Rodgers throw to Devontae Adams for years and Devontae Adams makes that play. I'm not asking you to be Devontae Adams, but you have to be a better football player than that. And you have to be able to help your young quarterback in these positions. Um, and then, you know, the second part of this whole thing was the, the Luke Getzey play calling, especially early on. I had a huge problem with it, right? The Bears had two big drives in that first quarter where, in my opinion, with a little bit more aggressive play calling, they should have been able to come close to, to getting a touchdown. The first drive that results in a field goal, you know, they've got first and 10 at the Giants' 14-yard line, I believe it was. And what does he do? He goes two straight runs to Khalil Herbert up the field, 
And then all of a sudden, you know, it's it's third and long and you're throwing the football and you're out. And he does the exact same thing. When you're in the red zone, you have the defense on your heels. You've got to get more aggressive on first and second down. You've got to be able to let Justin Fields throw the football. He's in an advantage. He's in plus territory. This is where he has his strength to be able to use his legs and also with these short, quick throws. And instead, Luke Getze is throwing the football, uh, running the football on first and second down and um and, and putting them in third and long situations, that's just not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. Um, yes, I am wildly dismissive. I'm sorry. When you, when you're wild. You know, I, I'm wild. Listen, I, 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 it's, it's, you, can't cut, you can't give out brownie points here. Or you can't sugarcoat the fact that there are, there's poor talent on the offensive yeah. side of the football. I, I don't know what else to say. It's, I don't think it's a hot take to say Sam Mustard is the worst starting center in the NFL. And the, the numbers and stats show it. I don't think Dante Pettis is a starting wide receiver. The guy wasn't even in the league last year, right? And so, I mean, it's it's not wildly dismissive to say these kind of things. You've got to wake up at some point and, and, and just come to grips with the fact that this is our reality. Yeah, I 100% agree with you, Ross. And, and you just look at the receivers surrounding Justin Fields, in addition to the offensive line that has been struggling. You knew going into the offseason, going into training camp, I should say, that this team was really just trying to figure out how to bolster the offensive line and create more of a good pocket for Justin Fields, create more running lanes and, and be able to move the pocket. But, you know, whether that be Riley Reef or um, another guy that would plug in nicely, it just has not happened thus far. And it's been incredibly tough to watch. But But the wide receivers have been putrid as well. You look at a Darnell Mooney who's – Finally had a, a decent game. He had four catches for 94 yards. Outside of that, really, it's just some dump-offs. And, and to Cole Komet has not been the guy that we thought. It's been tough to see. And, you know, the offense is putrid and all, and that's been evident through four games. But the Bears are scared to throw the ball as far as coaching is concerned. And it, if you look at the, the stats, it's just it's really eye-popping. When they're last in the league in passing yards, we talked about this last time we had a show, they're tied for – the lowest number of passing touchdowns, um, you know, completions, attempts, passer ratings between fields and this passing offense, just dead last. They're tied last in passing touchdowns, scared to throw in the red zone. But of course, Lugetzi doesn't think fields has had a rough month. He said, quote, I think he's gotten better each week. I think which you look at last week, maybe he has, he got 174 yards. I think he's growing tremendously and you know, it's not easy. We're playing good football teams and it's not easy to become the level of quarterback that he wants to become. And I know that he can become the important thing is that we stay focused, keep our eyes on that progress or on that process. And we make sure we get better each and every week. And I believe that we're in that phase, which is a lot of coach speak, right? You're going to rah, rah. You're going to say all that. You're not going to, you're not going to throw your quarterback under the bus here. Absolutely not. And Ross, you, you talked about a lot in that Giants game and mostly the offense. I don't know if there's a fix besides getting healthy and and if at right wide receiver especially and retooling that offensive line at this point. We know that the Bears are, are going to be at the bottom of the league, it looks like, at this point because the schedule's only getting tougher as, as the divisional opponents come around. Detroit is leading the league in offense right now. The Vikings look really good on offense with Dalvin Cook at healthy Justin Jefferson, and we know what the Packers can do. Aaron Rodgers throwing to whether it's you or Alan Lazard, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're going to roll. So they look like they'll be last in the division. But, you know, as far as what <laughs> as far as what Luke Getzey said, I mean, do you back him up? Or is there any way that he should have spun this? I, I, I can't believe that. I mean, I understand him defending Justin Fields like he did, but. I mean, what can he do? They're just all playing scared at this point. What can they do to to try and improve going into this game against the Vikings coming up Sunday? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's not much that he can say, right? Because, I, listen, you, you have to keep putting confidence in your gun, your quarterback who's got less than 20 starts. Um, and he struggled as well. He, he has to – he's missed some throws throughout the first four games, so he's not – um, absolved of any blame here. I actually think that Luke Getze called a pretty solid game on Sunday, I, and by all and large. I think the red zone stuff is where I had the biggest problem with him, but I like his play calling sure. on Sunday. He just doesn't have the horses out there to be able to execute. And, and you know, everybody's broken down all 22 this week. You've seen the plays. Sam Mustafer had an 8.5 pass blocking rating out of 100 up front. That is 
unacceptable, right? Everybody except for Tevin Jenkins had a below average pass blocking grade. That is unacceptable. And, and you're not going to be able to really push the full ball downfield to get the, the, the ball to your receivers when guys are in your lap on every single play. And then you factor in the fact that really the Bears only have one quality wide receiver on the roster right now, and, and that is Darnell Mooney, who had a couple catches. He finally had a decent game. But, you know, Cole Komet has, has, has by and large been a complete miss, not only this year, but in, in the past years as well. And, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, this is what it is right now until we can, um, you know, get better talent on this team next year. You got to hope that Justin can be able to continue to make some small strides uh, with the talent that he has. You got to hope that the running game um, continues to, to do what it does. It's a good sign today that uh, you know, David Montgomery was able to practice for a little bit. I, I don't know if he'll be able to play this week, but he'll probably be able to play uh, for the Thursday night game coming up against Washington. And, you know, you, you got to hope that eventually, you know, it, this is going to come on the, on the shoulders of number one, right? He, he's going to have to have some superhuman efforts going forward if this football team wants to get anywhere near six, seven wins, right? And we haven't even talked about the defensive side of the ball either. He kept falling for the yeah. same play action boot against Dan, you know, Daniel Jones every single time. The same you know, thing. I think personally the Bears right now need a little bit of a shakeup on their offensive line, especially with Cody White here out. I would start personally Lucas Patrick at center. I think Riley Reef needs to get some action in there. And um, I, I think Sam Mustaford should go to the bench. Uh, that's my opinion. I would start Reef either at um, whether if you want to start him at one of the guard positions. I think Tevin Jenkins needs to be the full time right guard, stop rotating him. And I would go out there Sunday against the Vikings and I would go. Um, I, I would go Braxton Jones. I would go Riley Reap. I'd go Lucas Patrick. I'd go Tevin Jenkins, and I'd go Larry Borum. That should be your five guys for this Sunday, and that should be your five guys for the rest of the season. Well, you don't have an option to slide Cody Whitehair in there as he's on IR now at this point, eligible to return uh, in week nine. Matt Aberflus said it is not season-ending that he will be eligible to return. I would, I would love to know what other receiver on the roster would even start for the Detroit Lions who are tossing out their <laughs> number one offense and I'm on say Brown and the rest of those the weapons. I, I would like to know which which other Bears receiver on the roster would even be the third or fourth best receiver on those teams. It, it, it doesn't it's not there. It's not there. And yeah. if you think so, you are absolutely fooling yourself. Come down to uh LaSalle and Wacker tomorrow. I got this beautiful bridge I'll sell you. It's amazing. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Facts there, Ross. And and we talked about the defense and a big part about, you know, looking ahead against this Vikings team is, is going to be the defense trying to slow down Dalvin Cook and trying to slow down Kirk Cousins, who has had a really solid uh, season thus far. And Vikings are looking good coming off that London game and, and squeaking one out against the Saints uh, again look at a Justin Jefferson who's just balling out at this point uh he had a couple quiet games and then most recently um looking really good but Kirk Cousins he you know it it could be the same Kirk Cousins we're used to where he could start throwing interceptions and getting sacked and you start to throw out records when you get into divisional mashup matchups like this I would say um early into the season later into the season but man it, it's tough especially when Jalen Johnson does not practice this week so the edge is certainly with the Vikings, as I mentioned, for all those reasons. But the run game, the passing game, I don't know what this Bears defense – I don't know which Bears defense will show up. And and also, before I even put a pin on this Bears-Giants matchup from last week, are the Giants good? Are they a good 3-1 and one football team? I, I'm unconvinced. If Daniel Jones is fully healthy and plays that whole game, is it more, is it more impressive? Is it more persuasive that they have won – without a doubt and they are a better football team you know I, I i don't think they're a good football team i i think that they've um uh, gotten very lucky with the strength of schedule there early on here i do think that they are well coached i think they're well prepared i think that they're a team that knows their identity right now which is a lot of saquon barkley and um and i love the the, the scheme that that brian Dabble had on sunday he was a he was a coach that had his team in the position to win. And whether it was uh, Daniel Jones or whether it was Tyrod Taylor, who ironically is better to run that scheme because of his athletic ability, or even Saquon Barkley at the end there running a, a high school triple option play, 
they just knew how to, to, to win that football game, and they completed it. I think the Bears made more mental mistakes, especially on defense. Um, with a lot of those boots, um, I thought Kyler Gordon really struggled uh, in, in pass coverage there um, in, in the very limited opportunities that he had. And, and, and the Bears just got beat, right? I mean, you can't uh, have a muff punt if, if you're, you know, rookie Villas Jones. And I get it, it happens. I'm not going to beat him up over that. Um, but also, yeah, it. yeah absolutely. Rookie. But you know, running the football again on fourth and two, and when you're when you're almost in plus territory and, and, and time is running out, and you're down by eight points. I mean, that's just playing scared. That's if you're a coach, that's playing scared. What do you have to lose? If this is a rebuilding year, I would be as aggressive as possible. I, here's one of the things I don't understand with this coaching staff right now, is on the defensive side of the ball, they let those young rookies and those young players go out there and take their lumps and, and say, we want you to be aggressive. Whatever happens, happens, you know, mistakes and stuff like that. We want you to play through it. And on the offensive side of the ball, they don't do that at all, especially with, with QB one. And I think that bothers me the most is a lot of these third down plays and these fourth down plays. I want the ball in Justin Fields hands at this point. I need him to throw more still. I think you said it. And, and talking about the offensive line, it is looking like Braxton Jones, Lucas Patrick, Sam Mustafer, Tevin Jenkins, and Larry Borum. That's who you're going to spot out against the Vikings. Uh, I'm wondering if Nikhil Harry will make any sort of difference at all. I know you just talked about trashing this wide receiving core, uh, but I'm just curious for the sake of weapons. And I do, I do wonder, Ross, to myself aloud as well, is Justin Fields going to progress or is he just going to, to stagnate and just be poor based on the, the coaching, the offensive line, just this this combination of things around him? Or is he going to start to see – are we going to start to see some improvement at some point? I mean, I hope so, right? I, I mean, at this point, listen, he, even with all that's happened the first you know, four games of the season, we did see some improvement on Sunday. I, I mean, I thought he made some key throws. There's some, there's some great throws to Mooney down the field. Um, I, I thought he made some great throws in the middle of the field. I thought he was a little bit more decisive. I still would want to see him you know, hang in the pocket more and make these throws, but also when the pass protection is breaking down, it's really tough for a young man to do that. I think he did miss one big throw to Darnell Mooney down the seam for, for a touchdown there. I thought uh, in the first opening drive there, he missed the throw to Cole Komet in the flat as well. So he has missed throws. But I think when, you ha- when you're asking a guy under 20 starts to be perfect, at quarterback position because so much around him is a mess. That's a huge mistake, but I do think he'll get better. Ironically, this is the week that you can start to see him stack some better stats. The Vikings on defense are not very good. This is the 27th ranked defense against the pass. This is the 27th ranked defense in yards giving up and offensive yards giving up. We saw Andy Dalton and the Saints last week really be able to move the football pretty consistently. That's Andy Dalton on the football field. That's also Andy Dalton without Michael Thomas, and that's Andy Dalton without Alvin Kamara. They were able to move the football field against his Vikings defense. It took a kick late from the Saints to miss it to put a cap on that football game. So hopefully win or lose, the Bears have to be able to still move the football. I would, I, you know, it, it sucks because you want them to win this Sunday, but I would almost be be happy with a loss if Justin Fields came out of this with 250 yards through the air and two touchdowns. Oh my. Ross, by the way, your mic like a cord is, is rubbing or something's going on. I've just that rubbing. like you talk, it's rubbing. You you can hear it. I don't know. You might want to readjust it. But as far as this Bears offense and and in football, we know this. You you got to put up points, and Bears are dead last, 16 points a game. That's inexcusable. 32nd in passing yards. They haven't cracked 100 yards a game yet. It's putrid. And when you're when you're excelling at the run, you at least I mean you're staying in games. You're competitive. And part of me, of course, wants to root for the Bears to be pretty shitty because it will hopefully turn into a better draft pick at some point and. And I do think there's something to be said for the way a team is built that way. But you want that experience for Justin Fields and you want to start seeing him play better football. And I think, you know, in the comments, Torian was just pointing out, we're going to see Vilas Jones hopefully getting more opportunities. And I think that he's that type of rookie that will look and, and put that muff punt in the rearview mirror, right? And then he'll go out there and hopefully be a dynamic playmaking wide receiver as he gets more experience going into later in the season. It is still very early on. We know it's 17-game season. The Bears uh, should match up well against the Vikings. As we talked about, it's a poor defense. So 
build some confidence, take some shots. You're traveling again. You have nothing to lose. You're two and two, your 500 football team, start taking some shots to whoever's out there, whether it be Komet, whether it be Villas Jones, if it has to be Darnell Mooney, you don't have a good offensive line around you. You have pretty good running game behind you, but don't lean on that. You should try to be taking more shots and get more creative with this offense and, and work on the bootlegs, work on the play action, work on rolling out the pocket, do what you can there. And the offensive line, I know that this offense and this Bears team as a whole, they, they got to really mute the media, but they got to know that this, this the media, the pro football focus people, everybody's talking shit about them. The, the offensive line, like Tevin Jenkins and, and Borum, guys like this who, you know, are, are at this point in their careers, they have a lot to play for and it's experience beyond that. And you're playing for your future Bears career. So I'd just like to see some fight in them. And you didn't see it in the Giants. I know some bounces go a certain way again that at Velas Jones muff punt was basically the the nail in the coffin that really cost the bears any sort of a comeback, but, but you knew the offense was struggling in the first place, but I, I just need to see more competition. And I will certainly say it'll be just as, as competitive. It'll be more competitive than the bears against green Bay uh, is what I'm hoping. And, and hopefully, you know, the Vikings still got a little bit of jet lag or something going on here, but they've, they've got a clicking right now on offense. And, and that's largely due to, to um, Turk Cousins and, and what he's been doing. They do. And, and, you know, I get concerned about going against Justin Jefferson, who has burned the Bears in the past. He hasn't had uh, anything. Yeah, he hasn't anything in less than a 100-yard game against the Bears so far in his very young career. Um, so that worries me because Jalen Johnson probably not going to play again on this Sunday. He was limited in practice today. It doesn't sound good uh, for him going into this Sunday, uh, which means, again, we get, you know, Vildor on the outside and, and we get Gordon on the inside. And that hasn't really uh, done too well for the Bears to start the season. Yeah, also, Cesar pointed out, Nail in the Coffin was settling for field goals. Four field goals and Michael Badgley isn't even on the team anymore. Oh, poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> at least you're fine for that. Uh, we have to say RIP Jerry Venisi, who just died at the age of 80. Uh, speaking of better football teams, uh, Bears football teams, that is, he's the only GM in recent years to get the Bears to a Super Bowl mm-hmm. and uh, I should say winning a Super Bowl trophy and, and putting together a dominant team in four years when he was a GM. A Chicago native and between the negotiations of, you know, Dick's contract and then getting just numerous Hall of Famers like Richard Dent and Dan Hampton and and putting that team together uh, to succeed and putting together the arguably the most dominant team in league history, uh, RIP to him. What a legacy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. RIP. Yes, sir. But let's move on to the rest of the NFL. Got to talk about week four, and we're starting to, again, separate a little bit of the, the contenders and pretenders, but it's a long season. We're seeing some injuries take effect, and, and some teams are just built – to overcome that. And I'm talking about the NFC East and talking about Dallas, which is an upstart right now and how Cooper rush is really impressive. And the Cowboys that you thought they would have been doomed when Dak went out for what seems like the third or fourth time. It's the same story where Dak gets hurt and the NFC East just looks like dog shit for the most part, but Eags are undefeated. Cowboys at three and one under Cooper rush. And he has no interceptions. He's, he's looking great out there. He's looking like Tom Brady 2.0. They look like the new NFC West. They look really competitive minus the commanders. And if you've watched the show before, you remember week one, I was hot on the commanders burn that tape because (laughs) they're shit. Uh, They are not good. Uh, But it's the usual contenders. Other than that, teams of note are the chiefs and the bills, the Packers, the the Cowboys and the Dolphins, for example, off to a hot start, and, and it's still very early. But I'll tell you, the Dolphins they have a problem when Tua goes out with his. And again, that's a whole another issue with how the NFL has been handling issue uh, handling injuries overall. I know um, Dolphins in, in that game they caught a lot of ire for uh, uh, the official the officials and, and just everybody behind that when he should have entered concussion protocol. And man, just you know, it's bigger than football. Prayers to him too who hopefully come back and, and uh, you know, be fully healthy and, and be in a safer environment. But looking at whipping around the league, as far as scores are concerned, we talked about the Vikings improving to three and one, getting a, a big win over the Saints in London. These London games, man, they always throw me for a loop. So many of them. This, the, the Lions are, again, I mean, they're not good, but they're losing and scoring in, in droves. They put up 45 mm-hmm. against the Seahawks and somehow Geno Smith also uh, just lit it up. It was a duel between Jared Goff and Geno Smith. If you thought that those were going to be the two, you know, most high 
powered, you know, passing yards, like be damned touchdown throwing quarterbacks. I wouldn't have said Geno Smith and I wouldn't have said Jared Goff, but here we are. And Rashad Penny going off for two touchdowns. And, uh, you know, the game of the week, of course, was we're seeing the Chiefs and Pat Mahomes. They don't care that Tyreek Hill is gone at this point. Mahomes doesn't care what you think about the wide receiver position. He has Travis Kelsey, the best tight end in the league right now, and they have a pretty good defense. They had an answer for whatever the the Bucks threw at them defensively, and they didn't throw much at them defensively. Bucks, I can't believe, are on to at home at this point as uh, they fell to two and two on the season and surrendered forty one points to a very good Chiefs team. And, and the throws that that you saw Pat Mahomes make were, were just unbelievable. His his improvisation is just sick and. Tom Brady, I mean, out there, 385 yards. I know he's playing from behind for the most part. Mm-hmm. Three touchdowns. That was super impressive. But talking about another, you, you know, before I get into my next topic of conversation, what else stood out to you, Ross, in, in week four? Yeah, I mean, you know, to me, I think you talked about Dallas Cowboys. Cooper Rush is is looking like a very competent quarterback. He looked better than Dak did week one. And, I, I, you know, I think it's still Dak's team. But there's got to be a little bit of a quarterback controversy uh, popping up in, in what they're going to be able to do with that because uh, Cooper Rush has that offense humming. If they win again this week, then, you know, how do you uh, take that team away from them, right? Um, you know, a, a team that's playing right now, the Denver Broncos, are, are really reeling right now, especially on offense. They just cannot be able to muster up any points. And we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks, but the amount of money and draft capital that you spent on, on, on Russell Wilson and this not working out for you right now has got to be super alarming for that franchise. Um, you know, uh, other than that, Pat Mahomes is still Pat Mahomes. He, he's still the most talented quarterback that we've ever seen. And uh, he did some things on, on Sunday Night Football that were just mind-blowing, especially that little – toss pass that he had for the, to, uh, to the end zone there. And, you know, that's a huge win for Buffalo to be able to go into Baltimore and to be able to steal one against uh, against the Ravens there. I, I think that's a very uh, big, big win for them. And then, you know, finally, two teams for me going in two separate directions. The 49ers under Jimmy Garoppolo feel like the old 49ers, right? It's like, man, this is a this is a Super Bowl contending team again. It's a complete team from top of to bottom. Jimmy will do just enough every week to not kill that team, and he lets his playmakers do work. Guys like Debo Samuel, that catch that Debo Samuel made over the defender, and he runs for 57 yards for an end zone is exactly why I say you need prime quality talent around your quarterback. He, you know, that goes down as a 57 yard touchdown in the book for Jimmy Grapple, but that's all Debo Samuel on that play right there. And then on the flip side, the Steelers are looking like they might be one of the five worst football teams in the league right now to get yeah. knocked off by the Jets. They benched Mr. Trubisky and now they're going to Kenny Pickett and he goes against the number one pass defense in the league this week. Um, ugh, that's, it's going to get really, really ugly for the Pittsburgh Steelers in my opinion. That's trial by fire right there. And, and I was yeah. going to talk about the losers at length. And, uh, you know, obviously we knew that the bottom of the league would be the likes of Detroit and the Houston Texans. But, you know, even the P- Patriots, you feel like would have been better. I know losing Mac Jones for a little bit hurt. And the Colts look like the offseason would have yielded better results when you get Matt Ryan and plug him in there. But the Raiders really fallen off. Pittsburgh should have been much better, but this just speaks to the quarterback position. You have a really good defense and losing TJ Watt obviously goes without saying that's a huge blow for that football team. But looking at the positives for other teams and and what really has led to a lot of success for other teams is of course going to be quarterback play. And, and out there you're looking at Justin Herbert balling out. Lamar Jackson is incredible, but two guys that I think should probably be in a two horse race for MVP. If you, you know, look at the re- remainder of the season, they're really going to have to fall out. It's Josh Allen and and Pat Mahomes. And Mahomes, mm-hmm. again, it was evident playing against Tom Brady this last week. And and you've seen week in, week out, this has been a pretty tough stretch for the Buffalo Bills as far as schedule goes. And for them to be 3-1 and one at this point, got to hang your head on that. When you go and play the Rams, um, you know, you beat down the Titans, which you were supposed to do. The Dolphins, that was a close loss, their lone loss um, against this upstart Dolphins team. But getting that win um, in Baltimore was very tough and gritty at 23-20 win. Who's the favorite for you right now for MVP, Ross? I mean, it is Josh Allen He because he he's going to be able to put up the stats. He's going to be able to uh, win that division hands down. 
Um, I think Lamar Jackson is still in the mix. I know Lamar Jackson has a couple sure. losses on his belt right now, but his statistics have been, been absolutely amazing. He's having an amazing start to the year. But you got to throw your, our boy Jalen Hurts in the conversation. That is an undefeated yeah. football team right now, and that offense is humming. And I don't know when their first loss is coming. They could start off the season 9-10-0, and, and if they do – uh, Jalen Hurts has to be at top of the conversation as, as an MVP candidate just because, um, you know, he, he's been outstanding. The whole team has been outstanding, but you know, obviously we know that the quarterbacks uh, will, will, will take the credit for all that stuff. So Jalen Hurts has to be uh, in there. But you hit it on the head. Those are, those are four guys. It's Allen, Mahomes, Lamar, Hurts, right? If you're a betting guy, I'm pretty sure that Jalen Hurts probably has the um, – the, the, the best odds right now, um, but the favorites will probably be uh, tied between Mahomes and, and Josh Allen. No question. Pat Mahomes in that bunch has 11 touchdowns already to two interceptions. It's just incredible. What he's able, what he's able to produce minus Tyreek Hill, I, I know that he still has Travis Kelsey, but it's really impressive. And Clyde Edwards-Hilaire really helps out that offense when he's healthy. They look like a juggernaut right now. So looking into week five, Getting into the matchups, uh, as we're talking right now, the Broncos, as Ross uh, is criticized week in, week out for good reason, and Russell Wilson, the the multi-million dollar man that he is, um, that that's going to be a close, that's going to be a, one of those low-scoring games you take the under on between the Colts and the Broncos. Yeah. The games, you know, there's a game again in London, the Giants got to go from winning in in their home stadium to go to play the Packers in London, two, three, and one football teams. You, you take home field advantage, obviously out of that. And we'll see which team travels better at that point. But, you know, you're seeing at what point can, uh, you, you know, the, for example, the Rams bounce back, the Cowboys show some, some, um, some sort of sign of slowing down at this point. Mm -hmm. the Eagles, when are they going to lose? Like you said, they have a cakewalk going on, uh, going into, uh, the rest of the season, and and when will they lose? I think it'll be a division game, divisional game, before they lose to perhaps the Cardinals in this later game, and then Bengals Ravens is a good Sunday nighter. What else are you looking at, looking for in Week Five? Yeah, I was gonna say the the last three games on the schedule this week are the best the three football games in my opinion: Cowboys Rams, Bengals Ravens. Monday night you get Raiders Chiefs, right? Those are all three outstanding games against all three uh, you know potential uh, playoff teams, and and, and so. You know, it, to me, it's like the Rams coming off that big, big loss in San Francisco last week. They've got to be able to perform a lot better at home against this Cowboys team. They can ill afford to, to lose another game because I think the, the 49ers are really about to take off. Bengals Ravens, this is kind of a, a like who's going to be able to kind of step up and, and, and take that division. Both teams kind of um, underachieving a little bit out the gate, especially on the defensive side of the football to me. But the Bengals were able to get back into the win column last week, in large part due to the fact that, that Tua did uh, take another big hit and he's going to be out for the foreseeable future. Um, but, you know, it's going to be interesting to see as they have to go now to Baltimore on the road and, and, and can Joe Burrow be able to, to keep this offensive going and match what Lamar Jackson is going to do. And then Monday night, um, I, I think the Raiders are walking into a buzzsaw of a situation. They got a win last week, but boy, if they if they drop another loss, you know, they, they, they might be night-night uh, in that division. Um, another sneaky big game for me is, is Chargers-Browns um, just because – Again, those are both teams that, you know, again, when you're starting, when you start to realize that you're probably not going to win the division um, and terrible loss last week for the Browns in Atlanta, then you got to start to see who's going to be one of those wild card teams. And, you know, these kind of matchups right here are like, these are the kind of games where like, you know, you look at the schedule six, you know, week 16, week 17, you look back at this week five matchup, you're like, man, the loser of that game probably lost a wild card spot or something like that. So that's a big game for me. Um, as as um, you know, the Chargers will be on the road in Cleveland. Can Justin Herbert kind of right the ship a little bit? And then um, you know, finally, it's 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 um, it's it's Titans Commanders is for me because that's a big game in terms of is Ron Rivera this close to maybe losing his job? And right now we're on first coach fired alert. It's probably neck and neck between him and Matt Rule in Carolina. I, I think if, if one or two of those guys gets blown out this week, we could see something uh, shake up on Monday and, and one of those guys could lose their job. Oh, first coach to get fired. That's, you know, former Bear Ron Rivera. That'd be quite tough to see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in week five. Uh, I've, I got to ask you too, Ross. 
you know, as far as this Odell Beckham Jr. situation goes, I think there's a lot of suitors where he could go at this point. Mm -hmm. And it looks like obviously not coming back with the Rams. I think the Packers have been floated out there as one of those front runners. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Wherever he goes, he'll probably slide in quite nicely. I know Buffalo, who was at Von Miller, who was alluding to it for sure. Uh, Where do you want to see him end up and where is it most likely he ends up? Yeah, I think it's a two-team race for him right now. I think it's going to come down to the Buffalo Bills or the Los Angeles Rams. Um, obviously, he's very familiar with the Rams in that situation. Who doesn't want to live in L.A.? I think uh, uh, you know, Odo Beckham Jr. would love to spend his winter out in L.A., and I think the Rams really need it because they miss Bobby Woods uh, from last year. Cooper Cup is getting uh, a ton of targets. The Allen Robinson thing has not worked out for them at all. He's not been a good football player out there getting zero separation on the field. And they probably need Odell Beckham Jr. probably more than he needs them. And then Buffalo, it's like, look, who's going to be the guy that gets us over the top against when we see Pat Mahomes uh, you know, later on in the season? We're going to need all hands on deck. And, and so adding another weapon for Josh Allen – can only enhance your ability to go in there because you know Pat Mahomes is going to be locked and loaded and ready to roll. So, you know, right now that's the only team I think that Buffalo has has their radar on is the Chiefs, and they're saying, how can we beat these guys? And, and they might need uh, an extra weapon, Odell Beckham Jr., to be able to add to that offense, especially with Gabriel Davis, who's been hurt for most of the season right now with a lower uh, lower body injury. They had high hopes for him as their second receiver, but he hasn't been able to get on the football field. All right, Stefan Diggs can't do it all himself as, as much as he is him and a beast on the football field. Let's switch focus. Let's go over to the Hardwood Ross and the sure. Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls, I mean, the whole NBA season is damn near coming back. This is uh, October is here. It just sneaks up on you when baseball, MLB playoffs are, are coming up now or, or here, I should say. And then, yeah, the NBA season is here. The Bulls, uh, the offseason has been rough in, in the last month because of the Lonzo Ball situation, and now lucky to see him suit up at all for this Bulls team. And and really, it's what we waited for last year as a Bulls fan and, and a, an avid watcher of this team. You wanted to see this this whole roster click between him and Levine and DeRozan uh, to be that ultimate backcourt that would look like they would make some noise in the East. But at this point, it's doubtful, it, depending on who you talk to, whatever expert. And it, he's just been kind of a bust of a signing, especially if he doesn't play this season. That's just a huge blow. And you wonder what could have been, especially when they matched up. I know that they just got swept out of that first round by the Bucks last season, but you wonder what could have been going on with that team. So now Io Desunmu steps in second season. Now we know he had a really strong rookie campaign and it's much the same team that we saw last year with uh, Andre Drummond sticking around. You got Goran Dragic this year, who is, you know, the grizzled vet in the backcourt. You got Caruso. You got the Der- Derek Jones Jr. back. You got Kobe White, who is still pretty good and looks like he might be some sort of a, a guy that you could trade high on, hopefully get some good value for him, or he'll just be a good bench player. But I, I don't know what's – what it is in the cards for the Bulls. And, and don't forget Dale and Terry, of course, the rookie that they have now, who hopefully will be a, a good pickup for the Chicago Bulls team. I want to see them make a little bit more of a, a, a run into, of course, the playoffs and and be outside of Levine and, and DeMar, a more complete offensive team. Like, of, of, of course, you look at Memphis and the – and the Golden State Warriors of the leagues. So I want to see that. I want to see some improvement there. Defensively, you know what you're getting. And, and you know, we're getting an, another year here under the same coach and Billy Donovan. So I, I'm curious, Ross, what's what's your impressions? What are you looking forward to the most? What are you looking forward to the least as the Bulls are prepared to start up the season? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not super high on this team this year just because, um, you know, the offseason moves I wasn't too crazy about. They didn't really do anything to really enhance the roster. Andre Drummond is a backup center. Goran Dragic is a 30-something-year-old journeyman point guard at this point, and they're going to ask him to play, you know, 20 to 25 minutes a game to fill in that line the ball slot. And he's just not that guy. He's not that kind of guy anymore. So, really, if you're the Bulls, you have to hope that Io DeSumo and Patrick Williams takes a, takes a step forward, right, because that's the only way that they can really compete in an Ephesian conference that got significantly better than this offseason. I mean, you can't forget, you know, the Cleveland Cavs, you know, they went out there and they got Donovan Mitchell. Yes. And, 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 yeah, and Jalen Brunson is on the Knicks now. And, you know, even Boston got got, got Malcolm Brogdon. 
Um, and, and so, you know, to me, the Bulls right now are, are in that play-in team area because if you look at the East right now, you figure, you know, the top teams in the East, you're going, um, you know, you're, you're going Milwaukee, Boston, you're going Philly, you're going Toronto, we're at five already, you're going Atlanta, who got, uh, who got DeJounte Murray from, from San Antonio, that's another big move. And then you go out there and you're looking at Brooklyn, who still's got Kyrie's crazy ass, but you know he's still a talented player, and Kevin Durant, 80. and Ben mm-hmm. Simmons is coming back, right? And then you still have Miami. We're already at seven right now, and Miami was was you know a team that went far in the playoffs last year either, and that leaves those final kind of roster spots. And I didn't even mention Cleveland yet, and I didn't mention the Knicks yet, and and so you know the Bulls are kind of in that territory. They're going to be fighting anywhere between uh, eight and ten. Uh, for which is going to put you in the play in game. Um, and, and so, yeah. you know, they have to kind of tread water a little bit. They look probably pretty close to about a 500 team this year. You, ha- you hope that Zach Levine can uh, also uplift his game, and especially on the defensive side of the ball. But um, unfortunately, you don't really see high hopes for them, and um, you, you see them kind of treading water this season. I mean, to me, it's again going back to Io Desumu and Patrick Williams. Can those two young guys? take a step and be uh and, and, and be better than than role players if they can then i feel a little bit more promised but you can't expect for demar DeRozan at his age to do what he did last year and um that means you also need uh zach levine to be able to take a step up too and then you got to hope that fingers crossed lonzo ball is able to get back on the court around january and, and maybe the second half of the year and that would be a huge lift for them Bulls coming off of 46 win season and Ross, you hit it on the head as far as competition goes, Cleveland just looking like they might overtake where they'll be right neck and neck with Milwaukee, depending on how Milwaukee can hold up. Everybody's gunning for Milwaukee um, since they're a year re- removed from that championship run. And Giannis, we know is the class of the league, but Cleveland, man, they have assembled quite a team, uh, you know, years removed from LeBron playing there and Kyrie and, and how they were, um, such a, a force at that point and, and the rest of the east i know you're you're high on ben simmons stock at this point he <laughs> if he finds his jumper but but you do have Kyrie, and KD. <laughs> yeah somebody's got there um Kyrie and KD over there the knicks look like they might be retooling sixers we know the celtics even without their head coach they they should bounce back nicely so it's tough sledding especially in that division mm-hmm. and um you know, as far as the West goes, I'm excited to see some basketball coming back. You know, just seeing a little bit of preseason, it's wild to see. And you heard uh, Draymond on uh, on his uh, on the shop just talking about how he doesn't want any trash matchups. I like that of the, the Sacramento Kings of the league and the uh, the other shitty franchises that are not the LeBrons and and the other you know the Memphis Grizzlies of the league, something like that. But um, you know, it's it's so early. It's crazy to to think that now with football going on, we're gonna get all the, we're gonna get playoff baseball. It's one of those best times of years, right? We're gonna get playoff baseball. We're gonna get a little bit of NBA action early on, sprinkled in there, some good matchups, and then we'll get NFL football. Yeah, absolutely. I, it, it is a great time of the year. It's kind of when the the, the seasons change a little bit. We're we're back indoors. We're getting uh, closer to the spooky time, but. This is the uh, this is also the the time of the year you get like twenty seven straight days of football between college football and, and NFL yeah. action and then we get uh, baseball day baseball and night baseball and then the NBA is is starting to ramp up again as well which uh, we already got some amazing NBA storylines Draymond Green punched Jordan Poole yesterday in practice <laughs> which is yeah. just absolutely yeah. nuts right and, and so yes and so. This is a fun time of the year. I, I, I can't wait for it. Um, you know, I, again, just going back to the Bulls, you just hope that, um, you know, they, they don't fall in a big hole early on. And, and you hope that they can, they can stay uh, competitive here in, in the first couple months and, and try and tread water, at least hopefully uh, all is well with Lonzo Ball and that knee when you get him back on the court sooner than later. Looks doubtful right now, man. And that is a, a tough pill to swallow if you're a Bulls fan. And, you know, the, the great time of year it rolls on, too, is eventually we'll get to that college football divisional games where some of these top, you know, it's so top heavy right now are Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, Clemson. They're all undefeated. You, you got to see some of these teams lose at some point. But, it, of course, we're probably destined for another Alabama, Georgia um, bowl game, something or I should say championship game at this point. Mm-hmm. But, Ross, you're not excited for the MLB playoffs? 
not a dog. I'm not. I. You know what? The the White Sox season left such a bad taste in my mouth. And uh, <laughs> blame the know, White Sox. Godspeed to Tony Larusso, who who has retired uh, due to being old. And uh, we wish him nothing but the best going forward. But I don't even know who's in the playoffs right now. I know Jose Quintana starting right for the Cardinals in, in Game One. Um, I know that yeah. Aaron, I know Aaron Judge had an amazing season. I I, I saw yeah. the the countless cut-ins to to when he hit sixty one and sixty two, and, and all the teams that walked him in uh, in between. And um, and I know the the Dodgers are a juggernaut, right? And so, you know, to me, it, it, I, I will probably watch it when it gets closer to the ALCS and, and the NLCS. And I will watch the World Series. I love watching the World Series. But the early baseball, I don't want to fucking watch Cleveland play a baseball game <laughs> in the playoffs. I'm not watching that. So, you know, wake me up when, when we get to some of the bigger, uh, the, the big dogs here in the, uh, in the later rounds. But um, I do like the Atlanta Braves because I, I like the way they put their, their their roster together. I like their team, and, and I know that they caught the Bra- the Mets, excuse me, uh, later on, and, and was able to win that division. And those defending champs, and, and that would be really cool if uh, if Atlanta can go out there and, and and go far to defend their title. Sure, look at them. Yeah, it's it's aside the same from story. their aside from their racist chop that they do. Aside from that, yeah, they got a they got an eighty six that chop. Yeah, it's the same story. It's a yawn for me with Dodgers, Astros, Braves, Yankees. Just fine. Just wake me up when when the World Series is here. I will be fine with that. Quickly before we go to Ross's top five horror movies, yeah. White Lotus coming back. Are you a White Lotus fan? It's in Italy. I, Michael Imperioli. Oh, I like Michael Imperioli. It's uh, Sopranos fame, right? Coming back to HBO. Yes, sir. Um, I like the show. I, I thought it was a little more overrated than people kind of, you know, thought. Gasp. Yeah, I, you mm-hmm. know, I it, it won so many Emmys. I thought it was a little overrated to that. I did finish Dahmer uh, last week, which was really, really difficult to get through. But I, I plowed away and I got through ten episodes. Um, it was it's a good show. Good, Very good. good. Yeah, Evan Peters is was outstanding. He will win an Emmy for best actor. Um, shout out to Nisi Nash, who was uh, also was uh, also awesome as well. But um, you know, not for the the faint of heart, uh, no pun intended. As as we know, Jeffrey Dahmer liked to do things with heart, but to hearts. But um, very very well uh, done show, but very difficult to get through. I'm gonna look for some things more lighthearted going forward. As we, of uh, course, yeah. pivot to our horror movies. I was about to say, that's as good a segue as anyway. I was going to segue to Taylor <laughs> Twank being pregnant with twins at 48, but this is a much better segue. That's fucking incredible, by the way. That was my only random thought. Um, but, Ross, I, yeah. you know, I got to say, I'm bowing out of this one. I'm not a scary movie guy. I couldn't even yeah. think of fucking five scary movies that, that you know. You could put a gun to my head; I'd be, I'd be dead. Uh, I just never got into that genre. I'm, I'm sure I've seen some of the ones that will be on your list here. You know, I love The Shining. I love Misery. Uh, Texas Chainsaw was pretty good. Massacre and Saw. You know, so, so give it to me, Ross. Give me your top five scary movies. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, a, a bunch of a bunch of honorable mentions, especially from our generation. I think we grew up in the in the Scream generation, right? So, shout out to the Scream films. Um, shout out to uh, Final Destination films as well. We we grew up on that. Sure. We grew up on the Saw movies. So you know, shout out to those movies. Other movies you're not going to see on my list. I didn't put sci-fi movies on here. So like Aliens or, or Alien, even those those are are might be considered horror movies. Even something like The Thing, um, I didn't put on there as well. But um, for when it comes to older movies, I'm a huge fan of, of the older uh, older uh, movies. I think that those are the best horror movies. I think that they were shot the best. Um, I could even, name a ton of Hitchcock movies. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, listen. Uh, speaking of Hitchcock, number five on my list is a Hitchcock film. It is Psycho, which is um, the, the the ultimate psychological horror movie. Shout out to Alfred Hitchcock and, and Anthony Perkins. Who once said that uh, he was so good at playing Norman Bates that it actually ruined his acting career because nobody can see him as anything else other than Norman Bates, and, and he fell into a deep depression over that. Um, and, and unfortunately, he, he passed away uh, believing that his movie career was ruined by him doing such a great job as one of the scariest, scariest villains slash monsters of all time um, in, in Norman Bates. My number five, I mean, my number four is the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Again, this is a movie that is just 
absolutely amazing. It, it's shot so well. It, it's it's just make it's uncomfortable. It, it has you in these close knit quarters. It's a movie that has had multiple sequels. It's been remade multiple times. The remakes are not good. Although the one with Jessica Biel in it is not terrible. I, I will watch that yeah. one. Yeah, I like but, that one. Yeah, it's not terrible. It, she looks fantastic in that, which helps out a lot, obviously. Um, yes, but the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie is still absolutely just peak, peak, peak horror for me. You can still find it streaming to this day. Uh, you can. Um, number three for me is a Stephen King movie, um, but it's not a Stephen King movie that, that most people will pick. They'll usually pick like The Shining or Carrie or Cujo or, or something along those lines, Pet Cemetery. I actually am going to go with The Mist. Um, the Mist is uh. a super, super creepy atmospheric movie, and it's got an amazing, amazing twist at the end that I will not give away. If you've never seen The Mist before, um, watch it at night, watch it in the dark. It's a super creepy movie. It's an outstanding uh, uh, directed and, and casted movie. I thought you were going to say Mystery. <laughs> no, I love Misery. You know, Misery, um, as, as Stephen King has said many times, it, it's it's basically loosely based on on his uh, on his life story, and um, he uses uh, the the Annie character in Misery as a metaphor for the the drugs and alcohol that he uh, was addicted to when he wrote most of his uh, major novels that he has zero recollection of doing. Human Centipede is absolutely disgusting, and the the, the part that where does- they. The list they, is all they, over the place, by the way. And, the, and they poop at the end and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, my number two, the OG, the original Halloween, John Carpenter, the, the made-up Haddonfield, Illinois uh, town. Jamie Lee Curtis becomes the scream, the scream queen. Um, they take the old William Shatner mask and they beat it up and they spray paint it and it becomes the most iconic um, you know, mask of all time for horror movies. I still watch it once a year. It still creeps me out. It's outstanding to think that he shot that movie with like $15,000 budget and handheld cameras. Um, It's great. It's another movie that has been redone multiple times. I don't hate the Rob Zombie version. Um, I think that it's pretty good. I do hate the newer versions that they're coming out with. We're actually getting another Halloween kills in like a week or so on on Peacock. I, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis is like six years old. She's going to be doing this from a retirement home soon, but shout out to her. Get that check. And my number one is a, a, a not so well seen um, horror movie. So I always put it on my list. It is The uh, the Descent. And this is a movie that was, um, it's more of a European horror movie. It's about a group of young ladies that that go into a tunnel because they're, um, they're, they're rock climbing and they love doing adventurous things. And they um they found out that there's some creatures that live down there, and that movie gets scary, batshit crazy. And um yeah, again, it's another movie you need to watch completely in the dark. It's shot beautifully. These monsters are creepy as hell. The jump scenes are, are absolutely scary, and um, it is still my number one most recommended horror movie. Anybody asks me what should I watch because not a lot of people have seen it, but I promise you. It will deliver and it will give you the creeps. It is a perfect Halloween movie. Watch The Descent. That is my number one. Take mushrooms Take my- and watch The Descent. Got it. All right. It's cool. Yes. Or don't. Uh, no Shining? Did it, I didn't hear The Shining in there. I love The Shining. It is not on my list. It's a very long movie. Um, it, but- it is a very long movie. Yeah, to me, I, I consider that more of a, a, a psychological drama, even though, even though you do get some scary yeah. stuff. The Hellraiser is awesome. We're getting a new Hellraiser movie on um, Hulu, I think, within a week or so. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Shout out to the original Candyman in the comments. Sure. Um, shot in Chicago, of course, with uh, with Cabrini Green. You guys are throwing some great horror movies out there. I, I, I love this genre. I love this time of year. Even some of the newer ones, the, the Ring was awesome. Wrong Turn, shout out to that movie as well. Um, you know, older ones, Rosemary Baby was, is great as well. And... Yeah. Um, you know, I love all the 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 the, um, the Sam Raimi movies too, like Drag Me to Hell, and um, you know I, I can also do like a good uh, zombie movie too, like Evil Dead and, and some of the Zack Snyder right. stuff that he's done as well. So, oh, this is have, ro- this is this is John right up my alley, man. I, I watch during this time of year at least a horror movie or two on the weekend. I, I love it. Just pour some bourbon. Uh, you know, darken out the room, light some candles, get and get yeah. and get creeped out. <laughs> don't get too drunk and creeped out 
Yeah. <laughs> start, start sleeping with a golf club by the door. <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, we got a minute here. Did you listen to Freddie Gibbs' album? It came out, you know, the day before I got married. You should have seen me getting ready, listening to Feel No Pain with Anderson Pack and Raekwon. Oh, it was Push great. a T song, right? Push a T song was outstanding. His features are oof, just dirty. For those of you yes. who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about Triple S, which was uh, just released. Uh, set, soul sold separately. Soul sold separately. Soul yes. sold separately. Very good. Yes. Very good. Pretty good. What a discography. Yeah. Fucking guy, I was too. gonna it's say, incredible. yeah. At what point do we start saying this guy has one of the best starts in hip hop history in terms of his albums? I mean, he, he has not missed yet with his albums. This one is outstanding as well. I've listened to it three times already, and um, I you know I, I can't wait to listen to it again. Every time I listen to it, I've got a new favorite song. Right now, it is the Pusha T song that he does. I love it. That's a good one. The Anderson Pack and Rake one, one. Yeah. Just, just, yep. I can't get enough of it. We have run out of time, right? At an hour sharp here. Thanks to everybody for watching, listening in here on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your media. Remember to follow us on Twitter. Follow me at the Real of Mac. Follow Ross at Ross Reed and Barroom Network at Barroom Network. And there's no science fiction tonight. They'll be back next week. The next live show for the Barroom Network is Weekend Sports Betting Tips on Saturday. On Sunday, there's five live shows starting at 8 a.m. in the morning getting you ready for a full slate of Sunday football. For now, that's it for us. Everybody be good to each other out there. We say deuces. So long. Oh, bye.